you, and thanks for having me here. So I'm going to be talking about some work primarily from my student, our former student, Sleem Chowdhury, and our collaborator, Mike Gertz, as well as collaborators at the lab of Thomas Reed at the NIH and Alejandro Schaefer also at the NIH. And I'll just start by thanking them and our funding agencies and all of you for coming here. And what I want to tell you about is some work, I, I think, in the, the theme of the rest of this session on tumor phylogenetics. So since I'm the first in this session, I'll just mention, in case anyone's not already aware of it, tumor phylogenetics refers to building phylogenies of tumors, so of cancers. And although th this is a field that's really exploded within mainstream cancer research in the past few years, I think it's worth knowing that there is a long history of this within the computational biology community, dating back to work from Desper et al. in the late 90s. And originally, this kind of phylogenetic approach was based on the intuition that a cancer is essentially an evolving system. And if a cancer is an evolving system, then algorithms for reconstructing evolutionary systems should be useful for understanding progression of cancers. And in the early forms of this, it was handled by treating individual tumors as if they were species. So treating a tumor as a kind of homogeneous mass, building species trees of tumors with the logic that collections of tumors that seem to branch off similar points in the evolutionary tree are likely related in the sense of being similar subtypes of tumors. And what's happening on these branches would be suggesting important events in the evolution of these tumors. My own lab had come to this a few years later with a different kind of take on tumor phylogenetics, saying that tumors really aren't homogeneous masses. They're actually quite heterogeneous. There's enormous intratumor heterogeneity. And these variations cell to cell in single tumors allow you to build phylogenies of individual tumors. And so that's what we were trying to do, look at individual cells in single tumors and build phylogenetic trees one tumor at a time, and then look at comparisons across these trees. At the time we had gotten into this, technologies for profiling single cells were quite a bit more primitive than they are today. We had been looking at, and are still actually looking at, a technology called fluorescence in situ hybridization, or FISH, which is basically a way of fluorescently labeling probes in single cells within a tumor or whatever other kind of cell you're interested in. And this is very useful for tumor studies because most tumors have patterns of chromosome instability that cause them to evolve primarily by copy number changes, so primarily by gain or loss of genetic material. And being able to fluorescently label pieces of DNA allows you to count copy numbers of those pieces of DNA, which then becomes useful phylogenetic markers for tumor progression. So if you look at a single tumor by fish, you can observe populations of cells, not a homogeneous mass again, but a heterogeneous mass with populations of cells at different copy number states. And we had reasoned that we can build evolutionary trees by fitting an evolutionary model to these variations within the single tumor. And we could find that even with the relatively primitive data sets available then, it was possible to reconstruct phylogenies of single tumors that could start to reveal some important differences in how evolution of a tumor occurs from tumor to tumor, and in some cases even from cell lineage to cell lineage within single tumors. So this, as I mentioned, is a, a topic that has really exploded in cancer research in the past few years. A lot of the work that's going on now uses an approach that I'll refer to as regional tumor phylogenetics, essentially adapting those earlier desper type methods by thinking of a tumor as a relatively small number of sites that you can think of as more or less homogeneous. So kind of uh, average out the heterogeneity within local regions, and as long as you've got enough heterogeneity between regions, you can construct reasonably small trees from this kind of data. And this has some important advantages. It lets you use very sophisticated genomic methods because you've got a lot of genetic material even in a small region or site of a tumor. And it lets you use very sophisticated phylogenetic tree algorithms because you're looking at fairly small trees. Another approach emerged around the same time shortly afterward, and that is from work of Navin et al. bringing single cell sequencing to cancer studies. And that led to more studies at the level of single cells, where it became possible to really characterize the heterogeneity of a single tumor in great detail by looking at maybe 100 or so cells per tumor. 
but this had the appreciable disadvantage that it's still not scalable to large enough sizes to look at very large numbers of cells and very large numbers of tumors. So you can get a really good picture of one tumor, you can get a coarse grained picture of a few tumors, but so far work is needed to scale these up. And for that reason, we have been sticking with the fish approaches, which have the very significant disadvantage that you can only look at a few things per cell at a time, but the very significant advantage that you can get orders of magnitude more cells than these other techniques. So you can build large phylogenies on large numbers of tumors, or large phylogenies might be a few hundred cells, large numbers of tumors might be tens or, or up to a hundred or so tumors. So our earliest methods with this had worked with very simple data sets where you could get away with simple kind of heuristic approaches. But as we've moved to more modern data sets where you have more cells and more probes per cell, it became necessary to really think in, in detail about what we're actually trying to model here. And one of the recurring themes that's come up in our work, and I think the field really needs to be aware of, is that even though this overall intuition that cancers are evolving systems and phylogenetic algorithms should apply to them, even though that's a very nice intuition, when you really get into the details, you have to pay attention to the fact that cancers evolve very differently from species, and they need models appropriate to the way cancers evolve, and they need algorithms appropriate to those models. We had started from a relatively simple version of this in which we were looking at basically a rectilinear Steiner tree model in which we think of any given cell profiled on a set of copy number probes as a point in a grid. So the different copy number values assign you a coordinate in the grid. And then the problem is basically finding the Steiner nodes, the unobserved cell states that let you most parsimoniously connect the observed cell states and get a tree. That gave us a way of getting trees on relatively large numbers of cells. So these are examples. I know they're too small to really see the details, but we could get uh, trees for, let's say, a few hundred cells for dozens of tumors. And we could start to do inferences on how these trees are similar and different across populations. We could get enough edges in the trees and enough trees to start getting robust statistics that allow us to reconstruct models of selective pressures and how those change at different stages in a tumor, and to start doing classification and prediction. So to be able to make statistically significant identifications of, for example, in this case, this is illustrating predicting from a primary tumor whether that's a primary that goes on to metastasize or not. And it turns out that you can do this much more accurately using features we extract from these phylogenetic trees than you can from the raw cell data, which is more or less what a clinician would be looking at today, or even from more sophisticated models of overall tumor heterogeneity that have been proposed for these purposes. Now, the problem is that this is still a fairly simplified kind of model, and we've been working to try to get closer to how tumors actually evolve. One of the problems with studying evolution of tumors, and in particular copy number evolution, which as I mentioned is the main way tumors evolve, is that these simple rectilinear models really are oversimplifying the way copy number evolution works. Really, it's a multi-scale process in which you can gain or lose local pieces of DNA. You can gain or lose whole chromosomes or chromosome arms. You can even duplicate the whole genome. And all of these kinds of events occur in a tree, and that introduces a lot of ambiguity that is not dealt with in your standard phylogenetic algorithms. So in later work, we tried to bring in this multi-scale model, and we could start to see how in many cases, you get very similar features of a tree constructing it just from the earlier models versus the multi-scale models, but you also get some appreciable rearrangements where, for example, you might recognize that what looked like a lot of localized changes is actually better explained by a single whole genome duplication. And this allows you to greatly improve the accuracy of your trees. So this is showing accuracy of reconstruction of simulated trees as we add in these different scales of events. It's bringing down the error rate in phylogenetic reconstruction by about 40%, although even the simplest models substantially outperform your kind of off-the-shelf phylogenetic algorithms in trying to reconstruct trees from these data. And these better trees lead to better prediction. So more accurate classification from the old trees, which are the first two bars here, the newer trees, versus non-tree-based features, which are the final four bars here. So that's still oversimplifying, though. And so we decided in the latest work, so really the work I'm telling you about today, to see if we could get even closer to how a, a tumor actually evolves.
And one of the key problems is that even in these multi-scale models, you have to pay attention to the fact that a simple parsimony model is not adequate for explaining tumor evolution. Tumors are often under very strong selection, particularly if you're looking at a probe set that was selected because of its functional importance. So we have to pay attention to the fact that different genes or different local regions will have different rates of gain or loss. A single gene may be gained at a higher rate than it's lost or vice versa. And different scales of event will have different rates. And this isn't just a property of cancer versus non-cancer. These are going to differ patient by patient. So different cancers are going to have different forms of damage to the replicative machinery, and so they're going to have different models of evolution. If you really want to reconstruct your tumor phylogeny correctly, you need to reconstruct the evolutionary process of the particular tumor you're looking at. So our overall strategy for trying to pursue this was to take our earlier kinds of approaches and essentially rewrite the basic algorithms of these so that we could work with these quantitative models. So a model that tells us for a given tumor, what are the different rates of the possible evolutionary events going on in this kind of multi-scale copy number model. And using those rates, we could kind of rewrite our theory of phylogenetic inference to work with this weighted model, which gives you kind of crude maximum likelihood model, build phylogenetic trees, and then we could use the trees to refine our model of the weight. So basically do expectation maximization, go back and forth, and get good estimates of the evolutionary model and the trees that we could then hopefully use to do better prediction and better discovery of what's actually happening in these individual tumors and what features of these tumors are robust across tumor populations or tumor subsets. So I don't have time to tell you in detail about the algorithms because they ended up being quite involved. So uh, making the adaptation to work with these different rates was turned out to be a much harder theoretical problem than we had thought at first. But to give you kind of a high level idea, Basically, it's very easy to construct a weighted maximum parsimony tree of localized events only. Bringing in the chromosome scale events is a little trickier, but you can more or less recognize that you can group optimal weights or optimal paths in a tree into equivalence classes. And for any equivalence class, there are ways of constructing restricted subsets of paths. Basically, for any path, you can rearrange it into an equally likely path with the restricted form that we call a zigzag subpath. And then you can efficiently search among zigzag subpaths to find an optimal. And then bringing in the chromosome scale events is a bit harder, but you can use the fact that there aren't too many possible ways you can position optimal sets of genome scale events to be consistent with a given tree. So you can more or less brute force over those and then use the simpler algorithms to kind of thread between those and get a workable phylogenetic tree algorithm for these kinds of approaches. So if you want more detail, you can read the paper and really the supplement, which is going into great detail about the algorithms and the proofs. And then we decided to test these on various data sets. We looked at a set of simulated data sets, which is something you often need to do if you're validating phylogenetic algorithms, because you never really know the ground truth, and a set of real data sets of fish data drawn from different cancers. On the simulated data sets, this is just showing parameter inference. These black boxes are parameters we fed to the simulated data sets. The whisker plots are showing reconstructions of those parameters. And the key point is that on average, it gets very accurate estimates of the parameters, although there is a high variance from tree to tree. In terms of reconstruction of the trees, again, we can get about a 8 to 10 or 8 to 12 percent error rate in phylogenetic reconstruction at the level of phylogenetic splits, which is better than our best prior algorithms and much better than off-the-shelf phylogenetic algorithms kind of applied in a naive way to these data sets. And you don't need that many cells per tree to do this. A hundred or so cells to, per tree, you're not quite getting to peak accuracy. By about 200 cells per tree, you saturate and you can pretty much much reconstruct your evolutionary process accurately. And we can then apply that to these real data sets. So this is showing a few of these, a breast cancer data set and a couple of different cervical cancer data sets. And each of these, we have samples at two different stages of development. So in the breast cancer, we have the DCIS, which is a precancerous stage, and IDC is the cancer. And we can get some sanity check here. We know that some of these are oncogenes, like HER2. They should be amplified. They do show selective gains. Some are tumor suppressors, like P53. They do show selective loss, so that's always a nice sanity check. And we can also start to reconstruct 
features of these trees that tell us interesting things about the progression of the cancer. For example, noting that cyclin D1, an important oncogene in these cancers, doesn't actually show any selection in the precancerous stage, but it does show selection in the cancerous stage, but with a very high variance suggestive of subtyping. So it looks like this is a late-acting oncogene that acts in a subtype of the breast cancers, which is consistent with everything we know about them. Likewise, we could get information from an earlier cervical cancer data set. This was all oncogenes. They show up nicely as oncogenes, and we can see interesting effects like this PRKAA1 gene, which seems to act specifically at the metastatic stage, again, the subset of these cancers, and another uh, later cervical cancer data set gathered with a somewhat different methodology. Here we can see, for example, selective act activity of this TURC gene, which is involved in telomere extension at early stages in the cancer. And these improved models do indeed lead to improved predictions, improved ability to classify cancers in various ways, so primary versus metastatic, for example, and improved ability to identify subsets of tumors, in this case in tongue cancers that exhibit long versus short survival time based on clustering using phylogenetic features from these trees. So I'll just wrap here, up here with some conclusions. I hope this no longer really needs to be justified. For a very long time, it was hard work trying to convince anyone that building phylogenies of tumors was something worth doing, but hopefully that doesn't need uh, arguing for this audience anymore. But if you do this, you really need to pay attention to the fact that cancers evolve differently than species. And you need models of evolution that are appropriate to the way cancers evolve, and you need algorithms that are appropriate to those models, and that's something we are working on, and I hope many others are, well, are interested in working on. And those better models do indeed lead to better trees, and better trees lead to a better understanding of tumor evolution and improved power to predict future tumor progression. So I'll stop there, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. So we have time for one or two quick questions. Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, question, do you think it would be possible to incorporate somatic point mutation data to improve the accuracy of these algorithms? Uh, yeah, so I, I think it, it, it is. I mean, other people are building phylogenies strictly from somatic point mutations, and there, there are some challenges there that the point mutations in most cancers accumulate much more slowly than copy number variations, but I think that actually creates some nice synergies. I think combining them does have value, but it, it's a difficult computational problem to avoid conflating those. Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much for a great talk. Okay. Um, can you include any kind of spatial information between the cells? Because there's different um, theories on how these cancers evolve, and some people claim it's a clonal expansion where you would see different cells with similar genotypes cluster together, and other people claim it's a big bang, and then you would see a big, max of, a big mix of cells. Can you differentiate between these two? Uh, in principles, there are different ways of getting the kind of data we're using, but some of it is from paraffin embedded sections. So in principle, the spatial data is there. Uh, again, it's obviously useful in terms of what you would want to be able to figure out. Getting the algorithms to use it productively is a harder challenge, but I, I think that is uh, doable. There are ways of building that kind of constraint, not necessarily into exactly the algorithms we have, but into other classes of algorithms for inferring these evolutionary trees. Okay, great. Let's uh, thank Russell again. <laughs>